Section 108 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 108. A State of Siege. Return we now to Frank Curtis, his excellent wife and Captain O'Blunderbuss, who were living in a complete state of siege at the house in Baker Street. The captain was the commandant of the garrison and superintended all the manoeuvres and the devices which it was necessary to adopt to keep out the enemy. The front door was constantly chained inside, and every time there was a knock or a ring, John the footman reconnoitred from the area. Whenever any one was compelled to go out to order in provisions, the captain stood at the door armed with the kitchen poker, and looking so grim and terrible that the officers who were prowling about in different disguises dared not hazard an encounter with the warlike gentleman. The grocer, the butcher, and the baker lowered their respective commodities down the area by means of a rope and basket provided for the purpose, but they all took very good care to receive the cash first. The milkman and pot-boy were unable to supply their articles through the opening afforded by the door with the chain up inside and they likewise strenuously advocated the ready-money principle. The condition of siege was a source of great delight to Captain O'Blunderbuss. He was completely in his element. Little cared he for the opinion of neighbors. His feelings were by no means concerned. The house from the first moment he set foot in it was in a state of perpetual excitement. He was constantly ordering the servants to do something or another. A dozen times a day did he perform what he called going his rounds, armed with the poker in case a bailiff should have crept into the place through some unguarded avenue. And it was indeed with the greatest difficulty that Mrs. Curtis could divert him from a plan which he had conceived, and which he declared to be necessary, namely, the drilling of all the inmates of the house, male and female, including the five children, for an hour daily in the yard. As it was, he compelled John the footman to mount sentry in the yard aforesaid every morning, while the housemaid was dusting her carpets and so forth. Indeed, during the whole time that the domestic duties rendered it necessary to have the back door open. If John remonstrated, the captain would threaten with terrible oaths to try him by a court-martial. And once, when the poor fellow respectfully solicited his wages and his discharge, the formidable officer would certainly have inflicted on him the cat o' nine tails if the cook had not begged him off, she being the footman's sweetheart. Mrs. Curtis took a great fancy to the captain, and allowed him to do pretty well as he chose. She considered him to be the politest, genteelest, bravest, and most amusing gentleman she had ever known, and it soon struck her that his various qualifications threw her husband considerably into the shade. Whenever she felt low-spirited, he had a ready remedy for her. If it were in the forenoon, he would exclaim, Arah and be Jesus, Mim, it's no wonder ye dull, with the enemy besaging us in this way, and it's a nice mutton-chop and a glass of port wine that'll be after setting ye to rights, Mim. Then forthwith he would ring the bell and order three chops, so that himself and Frank might keep the dear lady company. If it were in the evening that Mrs. Curtis was attacked by those unwelcome visitors termed blue devils, the captain would recommend a little drop of the poteen, brewed after the fashion in old Ireland, and while he exhausted all his powers of eloquence and assurances that it should be as wake as wather and not too sweet, he would mix the respectable lady such a stinger that her eyes would fill with tears every time she put the glass near her lips. Sometimes he would undertake to amuse the children up in the nursery by going on all fours and allowing them to play at horse-soldiers by riding on his back. And then, what with his shouting and bawling and their laughing and screaming, it was enough to alarm the whole neighborhood, and very frequently did. All these little attentions on the part of the captain, either to herself or her children, gave Mrs. Curtis an admirable opinion of him, and he rose rapidly in her favor. His success in obtaining the five hundred pounds from Sir Christopher Blunt was considered by her as sublime a stroke of mingled policy and daring as ever was accomplished and his tactics in opposing a successful foil to all the stratagems devised by the sheriff's officers to obtain admission into the dwelling made her declare more than once that had he commanded the allied army at Waterloo, it would have been all up with the French in half an hour. 
The female servants in the house did not altogether admire the position in which they were placed, but they were so dreadfully frightened at the captain that they never uttered a murmur in his hearing. They moreover had their little consolations, for Sir Christopher's five hundred pounds enabled the besieged to live, as the captain declared, like fighting cocks, so that the kitchen was as luxuriously supplied with provender as the parlour, and no account was taken of the quantity of wine and spirits consumed in the establishment. We have before hinted that the house was a perfect nuisance in Baker Street, and no wonder indeed that it should have been so considered, for it seemed to be the main source whence emanated all the frightful noises that could possibly alarm nervous old ladies or irritate gouty old gentlemen. No sooner did the day dawn than Captain O'Blunderbuss would fling up the window of his bedroom, which was at the back of the house, with a crashing violence that made people think he was mad, and thrusting forth his head with a white nightcap upon it, he would roar out, john john two arms as lustily as he could bawl this was not only to save himself the trouble of repairing to the footman's chamber to summon him but also for the purpose of letting the sheriff's officers if any in the neighbourhood know that he was on the alert then john would poke his head out of another window and answer the captain's call and a few minutes afterwards the back door would open and shut with a terrific bang and john would be seen to sally forth to mount sentry in the yard with shouldered poker then an hour's interval of comparative silence would prevail while the captain turned in again to take another nap. But at length up would go the window again, out would come the head, and John, hot water, would roll an awful reverberation throughout the entire neighborhood. The confusion and dismay produced by these alarms were terrific, and the neighbors all threatened their landlords to give warning on the next quarter. For it was not only in the morning that the noise prevailed, but throughout the entire day. I and the best part of the night also. Sometimes the captain would take it into his head to discharge his pistols in the yard, or else he would have a fencing match with Frank Curtis, the weapons being pokers, which made a hideous clang. Then there were the rows in the nursery, which were truly awful, and by way of a variety Captain O'Blunderbuss would occasionally show himself at the drawing-room windows, and vociferate the most appalling abuse at any suspicious characters, whom he might happen to behold prowling about. These exhibitions frequently collected crowds in front of the house, and the captain would harangue them with as much earnestness as if he were a candidate at a general election. On one of these occasions the parish beadle made his appearance, and from the pavement remonstrated with the gallant officer who kept him in parlance until Frank Curtis had time to empty a pitcher of water over the enraged functionary from the front bedroom window. But the worst part of the whole business consisted in the goings-on at night-time. Just when sedate and quiet people were getting cosily into their first sleep at about eleven o'clock, Mr. Frank Curtis was getting uncommonly drunk, and though the captain seemed proof against the effects of alcohol, no matter in what quantity imbibed, he nevertheless grew trebly and quadruply uproarious when under the influence of poteen. Thus from eleven to twelve the shouts of laughter, the yells of delight, the cries of mirth, and the vociferations of boisterous hilarity which came from the front parlour, made night perfectly hideous, but no amount of human patience ever possessed by good and forgiving neighbours could possibly tolerate the din and disturbance which prevailed during the small hours. Then would the captain and his friend Curtis rush like madmen into the yard, shouting, roaring, and bawling like demons, so that the residents in the adjacent houses leapt from their beds and threw up their windows in horror and alarm, expecting to find the whole street in a blaze. These performances on the part of Frank and O'Blunderbuss were intended to show the officers that they were upon the alert, and that they not only had the desired effect, but accomplished far more, inasmuch as they produced an absolute panic throughout an entire neighborhood. Thus it was that Mr. Curtis's abode, lately so serene and quiet in the time of Mrs. Goldberry, became a perfect nuisance and a scandal, and had Bedlam in its very worst days been located there, the noise and alarm could not have been greater. It will be remembered that the captain's plan, when first he took up his residence in Baker Street, was to get Mr. and Mrs. Curtis and the children away on a Sunday night, and sell off all the furniture on the Monday morning. But this scheme was postponed at first for one week, then for another, because the officers kept such a constant lookout that the captain saw the necessity of standing the siege, until the creditors should be completely wearied of paying those disagreeable spies to watch the premises.' 
This determination was the more readily come to inasmuch as the five hundred pounds obtained from Sir Christopher Blunt supplied sinews to carry on the war in grand style. When the captain paid the second financial visit to the worthy knight with a view to the effecting of a further loan on the assignat which himself and Frank Curtis had resolved to issue, it was not because money was scarce in Baker Street, but simply because the captain admired the fun of the thing, and also considered it prudent to raise as ample a supply of bullion as possible. The rage which he experienced at his discomfiture on this occasion can be better conceived than described, and firmly believing that it was Sir Christopher himself who had dealt him from the carriage window the tremendous blow which sent him sprawling on the pavement in a most ignominious manner, he vowed the most deadly vengeance against the new justice of the peace. Picking himself up as well as he could, for the gallant gentleman was sorely bruised, he repaired to the nearest public-house to cool himself, as he said in his own mind, with a tumbler of the invariable poteen, and having reflected upon the insult which he had received, he thought it best not to communicate his dishonour and discomfiture on his return to Baker Street. Accordingly, having returned to the garrison into which he effected an easy entry, for no one dared approach the door when it opened to give him egress or ingress, he assured Mr. and Mrs. Curtis that the night was out of town and would not be back for a week. However, in a couple of days the wonderful adventures of Sir Christopher Blunt and Dr. Lascelles burst upon the metropolis like a tempest, and as the morning newspapers were duly dropped down the area of the besieged dwelling in Baker Street, the entire report was read aloud by Frank Curtis at the breakfast table. It therefore being evident that Sir Christopher was not only in town at that moment, but was likewise in London when the captain had called upon him, the gallant gentleman affected to fly into a violent rage, swearing that the knight was denied to him on purpose, and vowing to make him repint of his ungentlemanly conduct. A blunderbuss did not, however, in his heart mean to do any such thing as call again in German Street, for he had despaired of inducing the knight, either by threatenings or coaxings, to advance a further supply, and now that the worthy gentleman was a justice of the peace, the captain thought that it would be somewhat imprudent to visit him for the mere sake of committing an assault and battery. He accordingly invented divers excuses day after day for remaining in the garrison, and as funds were abundant no one urged him to undertake another financial mission to Sir Christopher Blunt. The reader must remember that Messrs. McGrab and Proggs were very roughly handled by Captain O'Blunderbuss when they visited the house in Baker Street for the purpose of arresting Mr. Frank Curtis and the honour of a sheriff's officer being particularly dear to its possessor, these worthies considered theirs to be at stake, unless they fully vindicated it by capturing the aforesaid Mr. Curtis in the long run. They therefore had recourse to all kinds of devices to obtain an entry into the house, being armed not only with a writ against that gentleman's person on behalf of Mr. Beeswing, but also with an execution against the furniture at the instigation of another of Mrs. Curtis's creditors. The tricks practised by these worthies to obtain an entry into the besieged domicile were as varied as they were ludicrous. On one occasion Mr. Proggs, dressed for the nonce as a butcher, and carrying a leg of mutton in a tray on his shoulder, hurried up to the door, gave the loud, sharp, single knot peculiar to the trade, and shouted, to chur in the most approved style. But the parlour window was thrown up, and out popped the head of the ferocious O'Blunderbuss, the countenance as red as a turkey-cock and the mouth vomiting forth a torrent of abuse, so that the discomforted Mr. Proggs was compelled to retreat with all the ignominy of a baffled strategist. On another occasion Mr. McGrab, attired as a general postman, rushed along the street, stopped at the door of the besieged house, gave the two clear rapid strokes with the knocker, and immediately began to look over a bundle of letters with all the feverish haste of the functionary whose semblance he had assumed. But John came forth from the area, and again was the sheriff's officer's object completely frustrated. Next day, however, two sweeps appeared in the street as black as if they had never known soap and water, and were accustomed to lodge, eat, and sleep in chimneys as well as cleanse them. But upon arriving opposite the parlour windows they beheld the captain and Frank Curtis taking sights at them, the two gentlemen having twigged the traps without much difficulty. Thus defeated in all their endeavours to accomplish their aims by cunning, Messrs. McGrab and Proggs worked themselves up to the desperate resolution of using force, and they accordingly took their post at the front door of Curtis's house with the apparent determination to rush in the first time it should be opened. But when it was opened as far as the chain inside would permit, and they beheld to their horror and dismay the terrible captain wielding the poker, 
they exhibited that better part of valor which is denominated discretion. At last, however, they could no longer endure the jeerings of their friends exercising the same agreeable and lucrative profession. And moreover, the attorneys who employed them in the Baker Street affair spoke out pretty plainly about gentlemen bribing bailiffs not to execute writs, and so forth. All these circumstances induced Mr. McGrab and his man Proggs to hold a council of war over two fourpennyworths of rum and water and the result was a determination that, as the various devices and the stratagems they had practised to enter the dwelling had failed, and as they feared to carry it by storm, the stronghold must be reduced by a surprise. It was on the very evening when the Blackamoor experienced so strange an adventure at Carlton House that the following scene took place in Baker Street. The clock had struck ten, and supper being disposed of, the whisky, hot water, glasses, and etc. were placed upon the table, at which Frank Curtis, his amiable wife and Captain O'Blunderbuss were seated, as comfortable a trio as you could wish or expect to see, especially under such adverse circumstances. John vociferated the captain as the domestic was about to leave the room. Stop a moment, you rogue, and answer me this. Is the area all safe? Yes, sir, was the ready response. And the kitchen windows, and the back door, and the yard gate, all right, eh, John? All right, Captain, I've just been the rounds. And all the provisions in the garrison, John? Plenty of poteen, demanded O'Blunderbuss. Plenty, sir. There'll be no more going out again tonight. That's a blessing, exclaimed the gallant Captain. John. Yes, sir. Take a glass of whiskey, mate, and slape with the kitchen poker under your pillow, my friend. Enjoined the officer, we must be armed at all points, be Jesus. I shan't forget, sir, said John, and having tossed off the spirit, he quitted the room. Now then, to make ourselves cosy, observed the captain, drawing his chair a little closer to Mrs. Curtis, pray, Mim, how do you feel your dear self this evening? Is it in good spirits ye are, Mim? Thank you, captain, returned Mrs. Curtis, I am quite well, but the least, least thing nervous. This strange kind of life we're leading, strange, Mim, ejaculated the captain, it's glorious. "'Glorious indeed!' cried Frank. "'I only wish the Marquis of Shoreditch was here along with us. "'How he would enjoy himself!' "'You will permit me, Mim,' said the captain, "'grasping the bottle of whiskey and addressing the lady in an insinuating manner. "'Now really, Captain, if I must take a very leetle drop,' "'began Mrs. Curtis with a simper. "'Well, my dear madam, it shall be the leetlest drop in the world, "'and so wake that a baby of a month old might drink it "'and never so much as thrip up as it walked across the room,' "'exclaimed O'Bunderbuss, whose knowledge of the physical capacities of infants "'was evidently somewhat vague and limited. "'There, Mim,' he added, placing before the lady a large tumbler, "'the contents of which were equal portions of spirit and water. "'You may tell me I'm a Dutchman and unworthy of old Ireland, "'if that isn't the prettiest drink I've ever brewed for one of the fair six. "'You're very kind, Captain,' said Mrs. Curtis, in a mincing, simpering manner. "'It's you that's kind to say so, Mim,' remarked the Captain, "'placing his foot close to that of the lady and ascertaining by the readiness "'with which she returned the pedal pressure "'that the tender intimation he wished thereby to convey was by no means unwelcome.' Frank did not, of course, notice what was going on under the table, and the conversation progressed in the usual manner, the captain and Frank vying with each other in telling the most monstrous lies, and the silent interchange of love's tokens continuing with increasing warmth between the gallant gentleman and the stout lady. Mrs. Curtis's spirits, however, seemed to require a more than ordinary amount of stimulant on this occasion. She declared herself to be very low, although she contrived to laugh a great deal at the captain's lively sallies and marvellous stories. But as the clock struck midnight and she rose to retire to her chamber, she found that the three glasses of toddy which she had been persuaded to imbibe had somewhat unsettled the gravity of her equilibrium. The captain sprang from his seat to open the parlour door for her, and as he bade her good night, she pressed his hand with a degree of tenderness which, as novel writers say, spoke volumes. Curthis, my friend, said the captain as he returned to his seat, be the holy poker. You possess a rail jewel of a wife. She's the most amiable lady I ever knew, and takes her poteen without any nonsense, be Jove. She's an ornament in a gentleman's household, and will drink her health in a bumper. With all my heart, exclaimed Frank, already more than half seas over. But I say, captain, 
Do you know that I'm getting very tired of the life we're leading? I wish we could put an end to it somehow or other. Be the powers, and that's the very thing I was going to recommend to ye, Frank, cried the captain, who was more affected by liquor on this particular night than ever he had been before since the first moment he had taken up his abode in Baker Street. But how can it be done? hiccuped Curtis. It is how the thing's to be done, cried O'Blunderbuss. Can't ye now bolt off to France tomorrow night and lave me in charge of the house? I'll manage to sell every stick to a broker, and then it's myself that'll bring over the wife, the children, and the money to ye, safe as if they were all my own. I don't like the idea of going away alone, Captain, observed Frank as he refilled his tumbler. But suppose we talk the matter over tomorrow when we've slept off the effects of the toddy. Be Jesus, the toddy has no effect upon me, exclaimed O'Blunderbuss, who nevertheless sat very unsteadily in his chair, his body swaying to and fro, in spite of all his efforts to the contrary. The conversation now languished, but the drinking was maintained until Frank Curtis suddenly fell from his seat in a vain attempt which he made to reach the whiskey bottle. The captain burst out into a roar of laughter, and while endeavouring to pick up his companion, rolled completely over him. He, however, managed, by means of many desperate efforts, to place the young gentleman upon the sofa, where he left him to repose in peace, and taking up a candle he staggered out of the room muttering to himself, Be the powers, if I didn't know that it was impossible, I should say that I was drunk. This was a conclusion which the captain was by no means willing to admit and in order to convince himself that he was perfectly sober and knew what he was about, he proceeded to examine the front door according to his invariable custom ere retiring to rest. "'Well, be the powers,' he murmured, as he stood contemplating the door with all the vacancy of inebriation. "'It's John that's a clever fellow. <coughs> After all, <coughs> be Jesus, and it's two chains he's put up, and two bolts at the top, <coughs> and two bolts at the bottom. <coughs> and be the holy poker,' exclaimed the captain aloud, his face expanding with the expression of stupid joy. The house is safe enough, for there's two doors. Supremely happy at having made this discovery, and moreover fancying himself to be lighted by two candles, in a word, seeing double in every respect, the gallant officer staggered along the passage and commenced the ascent of the staircase, which appeared to have become wondrously steep, rickety, and uneven. Stumbling at every step and muttering awful imprecations against the thunderous fool of a carpenter that had built such a devil of a lather, Captain O'Blunderbuss contrived to reach the first landing in safety. But his foot tripping over the carpet, he fell flat down, extinguishing the light of the candle, though at the same time giving his head such a knock against the balustrades that a million meteoric sparks flashed across his visual organs. "'Blood and hounds,' growled the gallant gentleman. "'There must either be an earthquake, or else be the powers. "'I'm really drunk.' "'Picking himself up, the captain groped about for the staircase, "'and finding it with some little trouble, "'he continued his ascent in a pleasing state of uncertainty "'as to whether he were walking on his head or on his feet, "'but with the deeply settled conviction "'that he was spinning round at a most terrific rate.' "'Captain O'Blunderbuss,' he said, apostrophizing himself, as he staggered along, "'is this rally you or another person? "'If it's yourself it is, I'm—I'm I'm ashamed of ye, be the holy poker. "'And I've a precious good mind to give you a decent drubbing, Captain. "'Oh, blunderbuss!' "'Thus soliloquizing, the martial gentleman reached the second landing.' But here he paused for a few minutes in a state of awful doubt as to which way he should turn in order to reach his own room. He knew that his door must be somewhere close at hand, though whether to the right or to the left he could not for the life of him remember. At length he began to grope about at a venture, and having encountered the handle of a door he hesitated no longer, but entered the chamber with which the said door communicated. End of section 108 Recording by Philip Gould Section 109 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry, 
The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Surprise, A Change of Scene It was about half-past three o'clock in the morning, and profound silence reigned in Baker Street, when four men, bearing a ladder upon their shoulders, passed like phantoms through the obscurity of the thoroughfare and halted in front of Mr. Curtis's house, where their operations, so far from being at all ghost-like, assumed very much the appearance of those proceedings which are carried on by creatures of flesh and blood. Thieves, however, they were not, but sheriff's officers they were, being our old friends MacGrab and Proggs, assisted by two other queer-looking fellows of the species which chiefly abounds in the tap-rooms and parlours of public houses in Chancery Lane. Mr. MacGrab, having satisfied himself by a close scrutiny of the number on the front door that they had pitched upon the right house, the ladder was forthwith placed against the little iron railings forming the balcony at the drawing-room window, and Mr. Proggs was ordered to mount first. But Mr. Proggs, having perhaps recently studied some book upon etiquette, would not think of preceding his master, and Mr. McGrab was doubtless too meek a man to take upon himself the post of honour. As for the two underlings, they very bluntly assured Mr. McGrab that they would see him unpleasantly condemned before they would venture first and thus the entire project was threatened with discomfiture when Proggs, overcoming his fears, consented to lead the way. Up the ladder did this hero accordingly drag himself, and had he lost his life in the desperate deed, the epic muse would have been compelled to deplore the death of the last of the famous house of Proggs. But fortune beamed upon Proggs, though the moon did not, and he reached the balcony in safety, Magrab ascended next, and the two subordinates followed, by which time the intrepid Proggs had obtained admission into the house by the simple process of cutting out a pane with a glazier's diamond, and thrusting in his hand to undo the fastening of the window. And now, behold the four men safe in the drawing-room, in actual possession of the place, four heroes who had just carried a strongly fortified castle by surprise. A lanthorn, which Mr. Proggs took from his pocket, was lighted, and a flask of rum, which Mr. McGrab took from his pocket, was drunk. The heroes then stole gently from the apartment, descended the stairs, opened the front door, and laid down the ladder along the area railings, so that the watchman, on going his rounds, might not raise an alarm of thieves. This being accomplished, they re-entered the house, and fastened the street door, the key of which Mr. McGrab secured about his own person. The officers next entered the parlour on the ground floor, where they found Frank Curtis lying asleep upon the sofa. "'That's our chap,' said McGrab, in a tone of deep satisfaction, as he threw the light of his lanthorn full upon the young gentleman's countenance. "'I shall take him off at once, with one of the men, and you, Proggs, will remain in possession along with t'other. Two on us isn't enough to keep possession again that devil of an Irisher, exclaimed Proggs bluntly, and the loudness with which he spoke disturbed Mr. Curtis. Starting up, Frank rubbed his eyes, then stared around him with the stupid vacancy of one who had only half slept off the fumes of whisky, and at last, as the truth gradually glimmered upon him, he said, in a hoarse, thick tone, "'Well, who the devil are all you fellows?' "'You'll know soon enough who we be,' growled McGrab. "'Come, get up, young gentleman, and don't sit there a-staring at us as if you was a stuck pig and we was ghostesses.' "'So you've got in at last, have you, old fellow?' said Frank, with an awful yawn. "'But I feel precious seedy, though. Can't you let me sleep a little longer?' "'You won't sleep no more till you gets to Chancery Lane,' returned McGrab. "'And then you can have a turn in if you like.' "'What o'clock is it?' demanded Frank, his teeth chattering, and his whole frame shivering alike with the cold and the unpleasant petition to which he had been awakened. "'It's getting on for a quarter to four, or thereabouts,' said McGrab, 
consulting a huge silver watch of the turnip species. "'Then I must have been asleep here for some time,' mused Frank aloud, and glancing at the table he added, "'Oh, I remember. I was precious drunk last night.' "'Well, I'm blessed if I didn't think you was,' said Proggs, expressing his opinion with more bluntness than politeness. "'You'll find a many lushing coven over in Spike Island.' "'Spike Island?' ejaculated Frank. Then, as a light broke in upon him through the mist and fumes of whisky, he added, "'Oh, I understand. The bench, eh? Well, never say die, my boys, as my friend the Crown Prince of Holland used to observe. If it must be the bench, it must. But you'll let me tell my wife what's happened.' "'We won't let you rouse that Irisher, young gentleman,' said Magrab. Let us get you safe off, and then he may wake up, and be damned to him. I pledge you my word I will not attempt to rouse the captain, exclaimed Curtis, but I must speak to my wife. Well, that's only fair and reasonable, said Magrab, although you don't deserve no good treatment at our hands, seeing how we was served by that audacious Irish friend of yourn. Howsomever, you shall speak to your good lady, but mind, I ain't going to lose sight on you. You can come with me as far as the bedchamber door, observed Frank, and I shan't keep you many minutes. Brogs, you'll come along with me, said Magrab. And now, mind, Mr. Curtis, what you're up to. We've got pistols with us, and blowed if we don't use them in self-defence if that Irish friend of yours happens to wake up and tries it on again with any of his nonsense. "'It wasn't my fault that he acted as he did the last time you was here,' returned Frank. "'But come along, you two, if you must go with me.' Curtis lighted a candle and led the way gently upstairs, McGrab and Proggs following close at his heels. They reached the second landing, where Frank stopped at a door, which he was about to open, when the first-mentioned officer said in a low tone, "'Now, mind, no nonsense.' We won't be done a second time, remember. I assure you this is my wife's room, returned Curtis, also speaking in a whisper, and he entered the chamber, the two bailiffs remaining at the door, which was left ajar. Frank, carrying the light in his hand, approached the bed, and was just on the point of saying, My dear, my dear, when he stopped short, aghast, stupefied, his mouth wide open, and every faculty which he possessed, save that of sight, entirely suspended, for there, by the side of his wife, lay Captain O'Blunderbuss. Both were fast asleep, and the countenance of the gallant officer seemed absolutely on fire, so red was it in contrast with the white pillow. "'By Jove! This is too bad!' exclaimed Curtis, at length recovering the powers of speech and movement and influenced only by the sudden rage which took possession of him, and which rendered him bold and courageous for the instant, he seized a water-jug from the washing-stand, and dashed the contents completely over Captain O'Blunderbuss. "'Blood and thunder!' roared the man of war, starting up in a towering passion, and springing from the bed, he was about to inflict summary chastisement on his friend, when a shriek issued from the couch and the captain, stopping short and looking around him, ascertained where he was. The cause of Frank's conduct towards him was instantly apparent, and subduing his anger, he exclaimed, "'Be Jesus! And it was all a mistake, me boy! I drank too much of the poteen!' "'The Irishman begulls!' growled a hoarse voice in the landing outside. "'Well, never mind, Proggs,' cried another voice. "'If he touches us, we'll fire!' "'Hullo, you fellows down there! Come up! Come up!' roared Magrab, and now the whole house was in confusion. Mrs. Curtis lay screaming and shrieking in bed. The captain rushed upon the landing with nothing on save his shirt, and looking as if he had just sprung out of a water-butt, Curtis followed, sulky and not half satisfied with the apology he had received relative to the presence of the officer in his wife's chamber. The two men who had been left downstairs were running up as hard as they could, and the servants were calling from the garrets to know what was the matter, but rather suspecting something very much like the real truth in respect to the invasion of the bailiffs. 
Down, down with ye, wild beasts that ye are, vociferated the captain, as the light which Curtis still carried showed the gallant officer the well-known faces of Magrab and Proggs. But the two men, who had worked their courage up to the sticking point, produced each a heavy horse pistol, at the appearance of which formidable weapons the captain hung back, and Curtis shouted out in alarm, "'No violence! I'll keep my word and go off with you quiet enough!' "'Be Jesus, and ye shan't though, my dear friend!' cried O'Blunderbuss, looking rapidly round in search of some object which he might use as an offensive weapon against the invaders. But the two men from downstairs now made their appearance, and Curtis put an end to all further hostilities by surrendering himself to them without any more ado. "'Frank! Frank!' shrieked his wife from the bedroom. "'Curtis, my friend, don't be a fool!' roared the captain. "'We'll bait them yet!' The young gentleman, however, took no notice either of his wife's appeal or his friend's adjuration, and rapidly descended the stairs, followed by the sheriff's officers. He was not only afraid of the pistols, but he was likewise too much annoyed at the bedchamber scene to care about remaining in the house any longer. Not having courage enough to resent the wrong which he conceived to have been done to him, he was nevertheless unable to endure it passively, and here signed himself moodily and sulkily to the lot which circumstances had shaped for him magrab and one of the subordinates accordingly departed with their prisoner to the sponging house in chancery lane while proggs and the other man remained in possession of the dwelling in baker street it was about half-past four o'clock on that dark and chilly morning when frank curtis entered the lock-up establishment owned by mr magrab the sheriff's officer a racking headache the result of the preceding night's debauch, a cold nervousness amounting almost to a continuous shiver, and thoughts of by no means a pleasant nature, all combined to depress the young man's spirits to a very painful degree. And as the door of the sponging house closed behind him, he murmured to himself, Oh, what a fool I have been! Fortunately, he had plenty of ready money in his pocket, and putting a guinea into Magrab's hand, he said, let me have a private room, and have a fire lighted directly. Please to sit down for a few minutes in the office here, observed the bailiff, pocketing the coin, while I call up the servant. In the meantime, the subordinate had lighted a lamp in the little, dirty, cold-looking place, dignified by the name of the office, and while Magrab went to summon the domestic, Curtis, who was a prey to that fidgety sensation which seems the forerunner of something dreadful, endeavoured to divert his thoughts from gloomy topics by scrutinising the objects around him. A sorry desk, much hacked about with a penknife and stained all over with ink, a small shelf containing a few old law books, a law almanac with thick black lines in the calendar denoting term times, a list of the sheriffs and under-sheriffs of England and Wales, printed papers showing the arrangement of the courts for the sittings in and after term, two or three crazy chairs, and a Dutch clock which ticked with a monotony calculated to drive a nervous person out of his senses. These were the objects which met his view. Everything appeared musty and worm-eaten. The office looked as if it never were swept out and there was an earthly smell of a peculiarly unpleasant nature. In this miserable place, so cold and cheerless, Frank Curtis was kept waiting for nearly half an hour, while the man who remained with him sat dozing in a chair, and every now and then awaking with a sudden dive down and bob up of the head, which painfully augmented the nervousness of the prisoner. At last Mr. McGrab returned, smelling very strong of rum, and followed by a dirty-looking old woman, who seemed to have huddled on her clothes anyhow, and to be in a particularly ill humour at being disturbed so early in the morning. "'Now then,' she said, in a short, sulky tone, addressing herself to Curtis, without, however, looking at him. "'This way.' Frank followed her into a short passage, and then up a narrow staircase, the miserable candle which she held in one hand and shaded with the other on account of the draught, 
affording only just sufficient light to render apparent the cheerless aspect of the premises. It was not that there was anything mean or poor in the interior of the dwelling, the office excepted, but there was an air of deep gloom, and also of dirt and neglect, which struck even so superficial an observer as Mr. Frank Curtis. The old woman led the way into a moderate-sized front room on the second floor, where she lighted two candles, and then set to work to persuade a few damp sticks, smothered with small coal, to burn up in the grate. The apartment was fitted up as a sitting-room, but had a bed in it. The walls were hung with numerous pictures, the frames of which were an inch thick in dust and cobwebs, and there was a sideboard covered with old-fashioned cut glass. The carpet was worn out in many places, and was also much soiled with grease and beer. The table cover was likewise stained with liquor and spotted with ink. The curtains, which were of good material, were completely disguised in dust and the windows were so dirty that at midday they formed a pleasantly subdued medium for the sunlight. Altogether there was an air of expense mingled with the most cheerless discomfort, an appearance of liberal outlay altogether neutralised by neglect and habits of wanton slovenliness. The fire burnt feebly, the old woman slunk sulkily away, and Frank Curtis threw himself upon the bed. He was thoroughly wretched, and would have given all the money he had left in his pocket for a few hours' tranquil repose. But sleep would not visit his eyes, and after tossing about for some time in painful restlessness, he got up as the clock struck eight. His burning, feverish countenance craved the contact of cold water, and the idea of a refreshing toilette rendered him almost cheerful. But the jug was empty, and there were no towels, he rang the bell. Five minutes elapsed, and no one came. He rang again, and at last, another five minutes having gone tediously by, the old woman made her appearance. His wishes were expressed, and the Haridan took away the jug. A third interval of five minutes passed ere she returned. Then she had forgotten the towels, and now a quarter of an hour dragged its slow length along before she came back bringing with her a miserably thin rag of about a foot square. She was about to leave the room again when Curtis discovered that there was no soap, and ten minutes more were required for the provoking old wretch to produce a small sample of that very necessary article. Yet for all this discomfort, the prisoner had paid a guinea in advance. "'Pray let me have some breakfast, as soon as you can, my good woman,' said Frank, humiliated and miserable. "'As soon as the kettle biles downstairs,' answered the servant, in a surly tone, as she turned to leave the room. "'And how long will that be?' demanded Curtis. "'Don't know. The kitchen fire ain't a light yet,' and she hobbled away. In a fit of desperation, the prisoner addressed himself to his toilette, but the feeling of utter discomfort still clung to him. The water seemed thick and clammy, instead of cool and refreshing, and the towel was so small that it became saturated in a few moments, and he was compelled to dry his face with a corner of one of the sheets. Having no nail-brush, he could not cleanse his hands properly, and the want of a comb left his hair matted and disordered. In fact, he positively felt more uncomfortable and dirty after his ablutions than he did before he began them and that disagreeable sensation kept him dispirited and wretched. He walked about the room, examining all the pictures one after the other, until he became as thoroughly acquainted with their subjects as if he had lived for years in that room. He then posted himself at one of the windows, and watched the people passing up and down the street. It was now nine o'clock, and the law clerks were proceeding to their respective offices. Seedy-looking men were hurrying along with mysterious slips of paper in their hands, and now and then a better attired person, in a suit of black, would be seen wending his way towards the Chancery Court, carrying the blue bag of his master, a barrister. Small parties of threes or fours would likewise pass up the lane, affording to the initiated the irresistible idea, which was also the true one, 
of tipstaves conducting insolvents to the court in Portugal Street. At the public house, opposite the barred windows from which Curtis was gazing, a small knot of very shabby men had collected, and it required but little knowledge of the specimens of animated nature in Chancery Lane to recognise their especial calling. In fact, they were individuals who belonged to the outworks of the strong entrenchments of the law, process servers, sheriff's officers' assistants, and men who hired themselves out to be left in possession at dwellings where executions were levied. When not actively engaged, they regularly haunted the public houses, of which they seemed the very doorposts, and if they stepped inside to take something, which was very often indeed, they appeared on intimate terms with the landlord, said Miss to the bar girl, and called the waiter by his Christian name. They had a dirty, seedy, mean and cringing look about them, and yet, if not adequately recompensed by the unfortunate victims of the law with whom they had to deal, they would become doggedly insolent and grossly abusive. Half an hour passed away, and Chancery Lane grew more attractive. A few barristers, in all the imposing dignity of the black gown and the awful wisdom of the wig, were seen moving along to the Rolls Court. Well-dressed attorneys alighted from their gigs, cabs or phaetons at the doors of their offices, and articled clerks, having thrown away their cigars when within view of the windows of their places of business, made up for lost time by cutting briskly over the pavement, flourishing short sticks, and complacently surveying their polished boots, tight-fitting trousers, and flash waistcoats. Frank Curtis sighed as he beheld so many, many persons in the enjoyment of freedom, but his mournful reverie was at length broken by the entrance of the old woman with the breakfast tray. His throat was parched, and he had been unable to drink the water. He now, therefore, eagerly applied himself to the tea, but it was wretched stuff and even extreme thirst could not render it palatable. He tried to eat a piece of toast, but the butter was so rank that his heart heaved against it. He broke open an egg. It, however, tasted of straw, and nearly made him sick. Having forced himself to swallow a couple of cups of tea, Frank rang the bell and ordered the woman to bring him a sheet of paper. This command was complied with, after a long delay, and by the aid of a worn-down stump of a pen and ink which flowed like soot and water, Frank managed to pen a brief note to a lawyer whom he knew, and who dwelt in Carey Street hard by. After a great deal of trouble, a messenger was found, who, for the moderate reward of eighteen pence, undertook to convey the note to its place of destination, just fifty yards distant, and in the course of half an hour Mr. Pepperton, the legal limb alluded to, made his appearance in the shape of a short, thin, sallow-faced man, with small, piercing eyes and very compressed lips. "'Well, Mr. Curtis,' said the lawyer, as he entered the room, "'got into a mess, eh?' "'Rather so,' replied the young man. "'But I don't care so much about that, as on account of being locked up in this cursed place. The fact is, I must go over to the bench, and I dare say Sir Christopher won't let me lie very long there.' "'You require a habeas, you know,' observed the lawyer. "'But are you sure that you are sued in the court of Queen's Bench? "'Because if it is in the common pleas or exchequer, "'you will have to go to the fleet.' "'The devil!' ejaculated Frank. "'But here's a paper which McGrab gave me.' "'Ah, that's right,' said Mr. Pepperton, "'examining the document placed in his hands. "'Yes, it's in the bench safe enough. Hello, he exclaimed suddenly after a few moments' silence. Here's an error in the description. Your name is Francis, and not Frank. Just so, cried the prisoner, his heart fluttering with the vague hope which his legal adviser's words and manner had encouraged. Well, I think, mind, I think, that it is highly probable we may set the caption aside, continued Pepperton. At all events, it would be worth the trying. "'but I must apply to the judge in chambers this afternoon. "'And if we do happen to fail, mind, I say, if we do, "'why, then you can pass over to the bench tomorrow. 
somehow or another persons locked up in sponging houses always feel confident of getting out on the slightest legal quibble that their ingenious attorneys may suggest they do not apprehend the chance of failure and of dispersing two or three guineas which they can so ill afford for nothing the process of applying to a judge in chambers seems so certain of a triumphant issue and there is such a spell in the bare idea that the door of freedom appears already opening to the touch frank curtis was not an exception to the general rule which we have mentioned and he forthwith desired mr pepperton to adopt the necessary steps although this gentleman assured him that nothing could be done until the after part of the day poor deluded captive little did he think mr pepperton was well aware beforehand that there was not the shadow of the ghost of a chance of success but that his only motive in suggesting these proceedings was to make as much out of his client as possible when pepperton had left the room frank curtis began to pace it as if he were a wandering jew confined to a very miniature world and he examined the pictures over and over again until they seemed the most familiar friends of the kind he had ever known then he returned to the window and beheld mr Magrab and one of his men just starting in a queer-looking gig upon a suburban expedition and having watched the equipage until it was no longer visible he bethought himself of asking for a newspaper he accordingly rang the bell and intimated his wishes to the old woman who after keeping him in suspense as usual for ten minutes or a quarter of an hour returned with a weekly dispatch a fortnight old and a times of ten days back curtis could scarcely control his indignation and tossing a shilling to the harridan he desired her to send out and buy him a morning paper she departed accordingly and in half an hour returned with that day's times whereby mr frank curtis was enabled to divert himself until two o'clock when he partook of an execrable chop nearly raw a potato that seemed as if it were iced and a pint of wine which appeared to have been warmed then how heavily heavily did the weary hours pass away and curtis more than half regretted that his friend o'blunderbuss did not call upon him he felt that for the pleasure of his society he would overlook and forget the treatment he had received at his hands but the gallant officer came not and what with another examination of the pictures a complete spell of the advertisements the news being already disposed of in the times and a cigar or two frank managed to dispose of the time though miserably enough until five o'clock mr pepperton then came back and frank awaited the report in excruciating suspense well my dear fellow said the lawyer flinging himself in a chair as if regularly worn out by hard work we have lost the point but we have this consolation what demanded curtis in the anxious hope of seeing another loophole promising emancipation why that we as nearly gained it as possible returned pepperton it was old justice fuselum that was at chambers to-day and when i argued the point he rubbed his nose with the feather end of the pen he always does that when the thing is very ticklish damn judge fuselum emphatically cried mr frank curtis a miss is as good as a mile and that was what the prince of malabar said when my bullet whistled close by his ear at that duel which him and me fought at boulogne three years ago but to speak seriously of business i suppose that there's nothing left for me to do save to pay the debt or go to the bench added the lawyer putting the alternatives in as nutshell a compass as possible well the bench it must be then ejaculated frank i will take out the habeas to-morrow observed mr pepperton and at about five o'clock in the afternoon the tipstaff will be at sergeant's inn waiting for you or maybe you'll have to go over to him at the public-house opposite curtis invited the lawyer to pass the evening with him but mr pepperton was engaged elsewhere and the prisoner was therefore compelled to drink and smoke in solitude occasionally varying the occupation by another spell at the times another long gaze of envy from the window and another scrutiny of the pictures at last when ten o'clock struck 
mr curtis was thoroughly worn out by feverish excitement suspense and annoyances of all kinds and he retired to rest with the fervent hope of enjoying an uninterrupted slumber till morning but scarcely had he begun to get drowsy when a tickling sensation commenced in a thousand parts of his body and limbs and to his dismay he found himself assailed by a perfect legion of those abominable little torturers termed bugs now mr curtis was most peculiarly sensitive in this respect and if there were ever a flea or a bug in a bed it was certain to find him out ay and feast upon him too but never in the whole course of his life had he experienced such an attack as on the present occasion never till now had he known bugs so numerous nor bites so pungent at length he jumped up in rage and agony and lighted a candle but vain was all search not a bug could he find the legion appeared to have suddenly disappeared like destiny they were always to be felt but never seen he could not sleep with a light in the room so having extinguished it he laid himself down once more for a few minutes he was suffered to remain quiet enough but at last back came his tormentors by slow degrees and scarcely had he torn the skin off one part of his body than he was compelled to flee another in this manner hour after hour passed and when he did at length fall asleep between one and two in the morning he was pursued by a legion of bugs and sheriff's officers in his dreams End of section 109section 110 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mysteries of london volume 3 by george w m reynolds chapter 104 the visit the habeas corpus frank awoke at 7 o'clock depressed in spirits and unrefreshed in body his head still ached, and he was sore all over through having nearly torn himself to pieces on account of the bugs. His face betrayed marks of the ravages committed upon him by his little tormentors, and his eyes were swollen from the same cause. He had not even the comfort of copious ablutions, for the process of the toilette was not more satisfactory on this occasion than it had been on the previous day. Thus all circumstances conspired to make him wretched. Before he sat down to breakfast he dispatched a messenger to Baker Street for a few necessaries which he required, and as he did not choose to write to his wife, and knew not whether O'Blunderbuss might still be there, he sent a verbal intimation of his wishes. The breakfast of this morning was no improvement on its predecessor. Indeed it struck Curtis that he had got from bad to worse by trying the desperate experiment of ordering coffee instead of tea. He, however, knew that it was useless to grumble and so having disposed of the meal as best he could he sent for the morning paper with which he whiled away an hour and a half until the return of his messenger who came laden with a portmanteau well who did you see in baker street demanded frank please sir i see mr proggs and t'other man which is in possession was the answer and who else inquired curtis please sir i see a stout lady as give me a glass of gin and a tall gentleman as give me a rap over the head returned the man and what did he do that for cried frank laughing in spite of himself cause he said sir that i didn't speak in a spectful way to him but here's a note as the gentleman give me to give to you sir curtis tore open a curiously folded letter which the messenger handed to him and the contents of which ran as follow be jesus my friend and it's meself that has a right to complain of unfriendly treatment here I have been waiting to receive a bit of a note from ye, and divil a line or word at all. At all. Your poor wife's distracted and has lost her appetite, and all because of your injurious suspicions. But I do all I can to console her. If you come to reflect upon the matter, Frank, ye must admit that though appearances was against me, yet it isn't Captain O'Blunderbuss that would wrong ye. For be the powers, and it's mistaken in the bed I was, what with botheration and poteen and the candles going out and divil a hapeworth did i drain where i was till ye powered the wather all over me so shake hands me boy and let us be friends again 
and sure it's meself that will bring Mrs. Curtis down to dine with ye at two o'clock this afternoon, and we'll send in the dinner and the poteen first. Prog's and his men are in possession, and I feel like a defated general. But they're on their best behavior, and so I have not been forced to give either of them a taste of the shillelagh. I'm sadly afraid that the chap you have sent up is a fool, so if he should forget to give you this letter, mind you ask him for it. Your wife sends you a million kisses through me, and believe me, my friend, to remain, ever yours, Gorman O'Blunderbuss. Very good, said Frank Curtis, as he brought the perusal of this curious epistle to an end, and having paid and dismissed the messenger, he sat himself down to reflect upon the manner in which he ought to receive his wife and the gallant gentleman. On the one hand was the sense of the injury he had received, or fancied he had received for he could not well embrace the double conviction that Mrs. Curtis was not faithless, and that the captain was not treacherous. On the other hand were numerous motives persuasive of an amicable course. The want of society, the shame of declaring himself to be a cuckold, and last, though not least, the infinite terror in which he stood of Gorman O'Blunderbuss. These reasons were weighty and powerful, and they grew stronger and stronger as the dinner hour advanced until they became completely triumphant when a hamper was sent up, containing cold fowls, ham, wine, dessert, whiskey, and cigars. No longer hesitating what course to pursue, Frank superintended the laying of the cloth and the arrangement of the provisions upon the table. He decanted the wine, tasted it, and found it excellent. And those little proceedings having put him into a thorough good humor, he received his wife and the captain when they made their appearance as if nothing had occurred to ruffle his mind with regard to them. Mrs. Curtis thought it necessary to go into hysterics at the sight of her beloved husband in a sponging house, but she speedily recovered upon the said beloved husband's kindly recommending her not to make a fool of herself, and the trio sat down to dinner at which they made themselves very comfortable indeed. The captain proposed that as the wine glasses were particularly small they should drink their sherry from tumblers and the motion was adopted after a feeble opposition on the part of the lady. "'Well, Curtis, me boy,' exclaimed the gallant gentleman when they had made an end of eating, having done immense justice to the viands provided. "'What are ye after now? It isn't staying here all your life that you can be thinking of.' "'Nor do I intend to stop in this accursed hole many hours longer,' interrupted Frank. "'I expect to go over to the bench at five o'clock.' "'The bench!' cried the captain, overjoyed at the plan chalked out. Be Jesus, and it's the wisest thing ye can be after, my friend. The bench is a glorious place, and you'll be as comfortable there as at home. The porter is the best in all London, and it's worth while to be in the bench for the pleasure of drinking it. Not that I'm a great admirer of malt, Mim, he added, turning politely towards Mrs. Curtis. But the porter of the bench is second best to rail poteen. Then the amusements of the bench, Mim, are delightful. There's the parade to walk upon, and there's the racket ground when you're tired of the parade, and there's the dolphin pump and the coffee house, a wriggler tavern. In fact, exclaimed the gallant gentleman, quite lost in admiration of all the beautiful views and scenes he was so enthusiastically depicting, the bench is a perfect palace of a prison, and I only wish I was there myself. I'm sure I should be most happy to change places with you, Captain, observed Frank Curtis dryly. "'I wouldn't deprive ye of the pleasure, me boy, for all the world,' cried old Blunderbuss, in a tone of the utmost sincerity. "'But what's to be done next? Those bastes of the earth are in possession of the garrison, and every stick will be sold up by them, the ragamuffin scamps that they are.' "'The wife and children must take a lodging over the water close by the bench,' said Curtis. "'And if Sir Christopher won't come forward to assist me, I must either get the rules, or go through the insolvent's court. I don't care much which.' My friend, the Earl of Billingsgate, did both. "'Be the holy poker, and it's myself that will call on Sir Christopher in such a strait as this,' vociferated the captain. "'And although he did knock me down from the carriage window the last time—' "'What?' ejaculated Frank, as much amused as astonished at the information which the gallant officer had so inadvertently let slip. "'Sir Christopher knocked you down.' "'Blood and thunder!' roared the captain, becoming as red as scarlet. And was it after making a fool of myself that I was? For sure, and it was Sir Christopher that was knocked down. And I didn't like to tell ye about it before, seeing that he's your own natural uncle. But it's myself that will call upon him and offer the most abject apology, and I'll skin him alive if he don't come forward as he ought to, and pay all your debts, my dear boy. 
so you perceive that there's some use in having such a friend as Gorman O'Blunderbuss, of Blunderbuss Park, Connemara, Ireland, added the marshal gentleman with an awful rattling of the R's. The sooner I move over to the neighborhood of the bench, the better, said Mrs. Curtis, for I am sick and tired of living in Baker Street. Just now when I came out it seemed to me that all the people I met laughed in my face as if they knew our circumstances. I wish I had seen them dare to laugh, cried Captain O'Blunderbuss, lifting up an empty bottle and flourishing it over his head. I'd have sent them slap into the middle of next week so that they should miss receiving their money next Saturday night. In such pleasant chat as this did the trio while away the time until about a quarter to five, when Mr. Pepperton made his appearance to announce that the office had been searched, that three detainers had been found, and that the habeas corpus was all in apple pie order. Frank Curtis accordingly rang the bell and ordered his bill. In about a quarter of an hour it was brought, and thus it ran. Mr. Curtis's account. Room, ten shillings, sixpence. Breakfast, three shillings. Eggs, six pence messenger to carey street two shillings six pence reading newspapers one shilling dinner five shillings porter six pence gin and cigars five shillings six pence bread and cheese for supper two shillings porter six pence room ten shillings six pence breakfast three shillings eggs six pence messenger to baker street three shillings Use of tablecloths, knives and forks, etc., a gentleman providing his own dinner, two shillings, six pence. Extras, five shillings. Total, two pounds, fifteen shillings, six pence. Why, my good woman, exclaimed Frank Curtis, amazed at such a terrific attempt at imposition, this account is absurd. Besides, there are two things in it that I paid for myself. I mean the messenger yesterday and today. Master says it's all right, sir, observed the harridan. "'And then you charge a shilling for reading two newspapers a fortnight old,' cried Frank, more and more bewildered as he studied the items of the bill. "'And five shillings for extras? Why, what the devil are the extras, since it seems to me that you have taken precious good care to omit nothing?' "'The extras is soap and candles and so on,' said the woman, growing impatient. "'Then be Jesus, and let me soap over Mr. McGrab with a shillelagh,' ejaculated Captain O'Blunderbuss, starting from his seat." "'It's after Robin, my friend, ye are, ye bastes of the earth.' Mr. Pepperton, however, interfered and represented to the two gentlemen that there was no possibility of obtaining redress. The sheriff's officers might charge exactly what they liked, and that it would be much better to pay the bill without any haggling. The amount was accordingly liquidated, and the old woman received half a crown as a gratuity, which she took in a manner most unequivocally denoting that she had expected at least four times as much. "'Well!' exclaimed Frank Curtis, as soon as she had left the room. Of all infernal impositions, this is the greatest. Supposing I was a poor devil, then you would have been bundled straight off to Whitecross Street at once, observed Pepperton. Lord bless you, my dear sir, there's an aristocracy amongst debtors as well as in everything else in this country. I always thought the law was the same for rich or poor, said Curtis. You never were under a greater mistake in your life, returned the solicitor. Money is all-powerful in England and makes the gentlemen and gentlemen are treated quite differently from common people. Such establishments as the bench and the fleet are for those who can afford to pay for a habeas, while those who cannot must go to the county jail. Footnote. Within the last few years the fleet has been suppressed, and the bench, under the general name of the Queen's Prison, has become the receptacle for all metropolitan debtors who are enabled to purchase the luxury of a habeas corpus. End footnote. These sponging houses, too, are places of accommodation for the use of which people must pay liberally or rather be robbed vilely, said Frank. But never mind, it can't be helped. When shall I have to go over to the bench? The tip staff is no doubt already waiting at the public house opposite, replied the lawyer. Then I'll be off at once, exclaimed Curtis, rising from his chair. Be the powers, but we'll see ye safe over to the bench, cried Captain O'Blunderbuss, for it may be that I shall have to thrash the marshal or skin a turnkey to render the people decently civil in that elegant establishment. "'Yes, you come with me, Captain,' said Frank, who had been thinking of some means to separate his amiable wife and his devoted friend. "'You can put Mrs. C. into a hackney coach, and to-morrow morning, my dear,' he added, turning towards his spouse, "'you can look out for a lodging somewhere in the neighbourhood of the prison. "'But you don't mean me to remain all alone to-night in Baker Street with those odious officers in the house,' exclaimed Mrs. Curtis.' 
not admiring the proposed arrangement. "'It would not be proper for the captain to stay in the house now that I am away,' said Frank, hastily and without daring to look at his gallant friend. Indeed, scarcely were the words out of his mouth when he was surprised at his courage in having dared to utter them. Fortunately, the captain took the observation in good part, and even expressed his approval of it, for it struck the martial gentleman that he should stand a much better chance of amusing himself with Frank Curtis in the bench, with the interior arrangements of which he was pretty well acquainted from old experience, than in the society of Mrs. Curtis in Baker Street. The lady could not, therefore, offer any farther opposition to the arrangement proposed, but she darted an angry look upon the captain, who responded by one of earnest appeal to her mercy. She now took leave of her husband, and was escorted by Captain O'Blunderbuss to the nearest coach-stand, and as some time elapsed ere he returned to the sponging-house, it is presumable that he had a little difficulty in making his peace with her. At length, however, he did reappear, and the messenger having conveyed the portmanteau over to the public-house opposite for which he only charged a shilling, the prisoner proceeded thither in company with Mr. McGrab and Captain O'Blunderbuss, Pepperton bidding them farewell at the door. In a little front parlour on the first floor of the public-house alluded to sat half a dozen seedy-looking men who were delectably occupied in smoking cigars and drinking hot gin and water. Their conversation was doubtless very amusing to themselves, but it would have been very boring to strangers, for the topic seemed entirely limited to what had taken place that day at the insolvent debtors' court, or at the judges' chambers. There in that same room were those men accustomed to meet every afternoon, Sunday excepted, at about the same hour, and their discourse was invariably on the same subjects. They were tipstaffs, or, more properly speaking, perhaps, tipstaves. They lived in the atmosphere of debtors' prisons and law courts, and all their information was circumscribed to the transactions thereof. When they were not hovering about the lobbies of the fleet or the bench, they were down at Westminster or up at Portugal Street, and if not in any of those places, why then they were at the public house. It was to one of these worthies that McGrab introduced Mr. Francis Curtis, and as the tipstaff thus particularized had not finished his cigar nor his gin and water, Mr. Frank Curtis and Captain O'Blunderbuss sat down to keep him company till he had. Half an hour afterwards a hackney coach was sent for, and the prisoner, his gallant friend, and the officer were speedily on their road to the King's Bench prison. Curtis spoke but little during the transit. He felt nervous at the idea of going to his new home. But the captain rattled away as if he were determined to speak for himself and his friend both, and the tipstaff was still in a state of uncertainty as to whether he should set the gallant gentleman down as a very extraordinary personage, or as a most wondrous liar when the vehicle stopped at a little low door in a gloomy brick wall. "'Be Jesus, and here's the bench already!' exclaimed Captain O'Blunderbuss, thrusting his head out of the coach window. "'That house there with the trees before it, Frank, is the marshal's and a very decent berth he's got of it. I shouldn't mind standing in his shoes at all. At all. But come along, me dear friend. Thus speaking, the captain leapt from the vehicle, followed by Frank Curtis and the tipstaff, and having traversed an enclosure formed by the gloomy-looking wall above alluded to, and the high spike-top boundary of the prison itself, the trio ascended a few steps, which led them into the upper lobby of the King's Bench. End of section 110 Recording by Philip Gould Section 111 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds Chapter 105 the King's Bench Prison. The upper lobby was a small, dirty, and sombre-looking outwork of the vast establishment. A huge clock hung against one of the walls, a roasting fire burned in the grate, and a stout elderly turnkey, who spoke with a provincial accent, was seated on a high stool near the inner door, watching the persons who came out of the prison, and on whose countenance the glare of a powerful light was thrown by a tin reflector. Group near him were several charwomen, and messengers engaged in the double occupation of discussing a pot of the best ale, and the scandal of the bench, while another turnkey, a short, active, bustling little fellow, who rejoiced in the nickname of Buffer, 
was seated inside a small enclosure formed by woodwork breast high, examining a greasy and well-thumbed book containing sundry hieroglyphics which were supposed to be entries of the prisoners' names. To Mr. Buffer was Mr. Frank Curtis duly introduced by the tipstaff, and the young gentleman's appellations were forthwith inscribed in the greasy book. He was then desired to pay his gate fees, which he accordingly did, and these little matters being settled, Mr. Buffer politely informed him that he might go inside. The head turnkey, who was the stout elderly man above alluded to, thereupon opened the door at which he was seated, and Captain O'Blunderbuss led the way, first across a small yard, next through the lower lobby, and thence into the grand enclosure of the King's Bench itself. Captain O'Blunderbuss turned sharp round to the left, and stopped in admiration before a low building with a roof slanting down from the high wall against which it stood. There, cried the gallant officer, in an ecstasy of enthusiasm, what place should you be after taking that to be? Why, I should say it was the scullery or the coal cellars, replied Frank. Be Jesus, me dear friend. You're insulting the finest feature in this fine prison, exclaimed the captain. It's the coffee-house. Mr. Curtis did not like to say how deeply he was disappointed at the unpromising exterior of an establishment which his companion seemed so especially to admire, and he therefore silently followed his guide into the coffee-room which was just large enough to contain four very little tables and yield accommodation to about a dozen people at a time. There was nearly that number present when Captain O'Blunderbuss and Frank Curtis entered the place, and as there were not two seats disengaged, the gallant officer put his arms akimbo, fixed his eyes sternly on a stout, inoffensive-looking old gentleman, and without positively addressing his words to him, exclaimed, be the holy poker, and I should advise some one to be after making room on a bench for my friend and myself, or I'll know the reason why. The inoffensive-looking gentleman shrank dismayed into a corner, and two or three others, pressing close together, sufficient space was obtained to afford Captain O'Blunderbuss and Mr. Frank Curtis seats, and the former, as he took his place at a table, cast a particularly ferocious glance around on the assembled company, as much as to say, be the powers, and ye'd better not be after having any of your nonsense with me. But as no one at the moment seemed at all inclined to make even an attempt to interfere with the gallant gentleman, his countenance gradually lost its menacing aspect, and he ordered the waiter, a slipshod dirty boy, to bring a bottle of wine, spirits not being allowed. The company presented to the view of Mr. Frank Curtis rather a motley aspect. There was a sample of nearly all kinds of social distinctions a sprig of the aristocracy, a broken-down sporting gentleman, a decayed tradesman, a bankrupt merchant, an insolvent parson, a ruined gamester, a prize-fighter, a horse-shaunter, an attorney who had overreached himself, a poor author, and one or two others who bore the vague and much misappropriated denomination of gentlemen. All these were herding together in a glorious state of democratic equality for a debtor's prison goes far to level distinctions, the lordling being very often glad to obtain a draught of ale from the pewter pot of a butcher. The entrance of Captain O'Blunderbuss and Frank Curtis, both of whom were taken for new prisoners and stared at accordingly, seemed to have interrupted a conversation that was previously going on, and for a few minutes a dead silence prevailed. But at last, when the wine which the captain had ordered was brought in, and that gallant gentleman and Curtis gave evident proofs of an inclination to enjoy themselves by inquiring likewise for cigars, the company recovered the feeling of hilarity on which the awful appearance of O'Blunderbuss had seemed for a few minutes to throw a complete damper. "'Well, how did Jackson get on today at Portugal Street?' inquired a rakish, dissipated-looking young gentleman, who was smoking a cigar and drinking a pint of port wine." He got sent back for six months, answered the person to whom the question was put, and who was a stout big man in very seedy attire. It seems that his schedule was made up of accommodation bills, and the opposition was desperate. You talk of accommodation bills, Muggles, observed the young gentleman. Why, all my debts are in paper of that kind. There's seventeen thousand pounds against me at the gate, and I'd take my affidavit that I never had more than three thousand in actual value. So I suppose I shall get it from the old commissioner. 
"'No, you won't, Pettifer, my boy,' cried a short, elderly, dapper-looking man, putting down a quart pot in which his countenance had been buried for upwards of a minute before he began to speak. "'Your father's a lord, and that's enough,' he added, looking mysteriously around. "'Well, so he is,' said the Honourable Mr. Pettifer, lolling back in a very aristocratic manner, and speaking for the behoof of Captain O'Blunderbuss and Frank Curtis. "'It's true that my father is Lord Cobbleton, and that I'm his second son. But, after all, what's a nobleman's second son?' "'Be Jesus, and what indeed!' cried the Captain. "'Why, my grandfather was Archbishop of Dumblin, and my father was his son, and I'm my father's son.' and yet be the powers, I'm only a captain now. But if I hadn't half a million or some trifle of the kind locked up in chancery, I should be after rolling in my carriage, although I do keep a buggy and a dog-cart as it is, and my friend Curtis here, gentlemen, wouldn't be in the bench for two hundred thousand pounds as he is, and bad luck to it. Well, but you know, Captain, said Frank, who was determined not to be behind his gallant companion in the art of lying, and who therefore very readily took up the cue prepared for him, you know, Captain, that the moment my godfather the Duke comes home, I shall be all right. Right? Right as a thrivet, me boy, vociferated O'Blunderbuss, and then we'll carry on the war with a vengeance. These remarks on the part of the Captain and Frank Curtis produced a deep impression upon the greater portion of the company present but two or three of the oldest prisoners tipped each other the wink slyly, as much to say, ain't they coming it strong, although they did not dare provoke the ire of the ferocious Hibernian by any overt display of their scepticism. Speaking of chancery, said an old miserable-looking man in a wretchedly threadbare suit of black and whose careworn countenance showed an intimate acquaintance with sorrow, Speaking of chancery, he repeated, leaning forward from the corner in which he had hitherto remained silent and almost unobserved. You can't know chancery, sir, begging your pardon, better or more bitterly than I do. Ah! Tell the gentleman your story, Proud, exclaimed one of the company. Pon my soul, tis a hard case and a stain upon a civilized country. A stain, ejaculated the old man, whose name appeared to be Prout. A stain, he cried, in a tone of painful irony. It is a horror, an abomination, an atrocity that demands vengeance on those legislators who know that such abuses exist, and who will not remedy them. Chancellors, vice-chancellors, judges, law-lords, members of Parliament, attorney-generals, solicitor-generals, all, for the last two and twenty years, so help me God, have been familiar with my case. And yet the Court of Chancery remains as it is, the most tremendous abuse, the most damnable inquisition, the most grinding, soul-crushing, heart-breaking engine of torture that the ingenuity of man ever yet invented. Yes, all that, and more, more if I could find stronger language to express myself in, is that earthly reflection of hell, the court of chancery. The old man had spoken with a volubility which had increased in quickness and in emphasis until it positively grew painful to hear, and his countenance became flushed with a hectic, unhealthy red, and his eyes, usually leaden and dull, were fired with an unnatural luster, and his chest heaved convulsively, and his lips quivered with the dreadful excitement produced in his attenuated and worn-out frame by the remembrance of his wrongs. Remembrance! As if he ever forgot them! No, the chancery court was the subject of his thoughts by day and his dreams by night. Everything he heard, or saw, or read, was so tortured by his morbid imagination as to bear some analogy, remote or near, to the proceedings of the chancery court. When he had a meal, he wondered that the chancery court had left it to him, and when he had none, he said that the chancery court made him starve. If he felt intolerably good health, it was because he heard of some case in chancery even more flagrant than his own, and that was a consolation to his diseased mind. And if he felt ill, which was nearly always the case, he declared that the chancery court made him so. In fact, he was truly a victim in every sense and way of that tremendous tribunal, which has instruments of torture far more terrible for the feelings than those which the Inquisition of Spain ever invented for the body. "'Yes,' exclaimed Proud, after a few moments' pause, "'and all that diabolical tyranny is carried on under the semblance "'and with the solemn forms of justice. "'You go into a fine court. 
where you see a man of splendid intellect, fine education, and profound knowledge, seated in a chair, with the wig and gown, and before him are rows of barristers almost as learned as himself. Well, would you not think that you were in a tribunal worthy of the civilization of this country? Yet better were it if savages from the South Sea Islands became your judges, better to die upon the threshold of that court than enter its walls. It is a damnable and accursed tyranny, I repeat, and the English are a weak, a pusillanimous, a spaniel-like race, that they do not rise in rebellion against that monstrous tribunal. Again he paused, overpowered by excitement. But there was something terribly real and awfully sincere, ay, and sternly true, in that man's denunciations. Yes, I say, he resumed, after having refreshed himself from a pewter pot near him, Though there had been a time when he was accustomed to drink wine, the English people are a nation of paltry cowards for allowing this hideous chancery court to uprear its head amongst them. Did not the French destroy their Bastille? And was the Bastille ever half so bad in one way as this chancery court is in another? It is all useless for two or three people to declaim, or two or three authors to write, against such a flagrant abuse. "'Tis a public grievance, and must be put down by the public hand. "'The whole body of lawyers are against law reform, "'and the profession of the law has vast influence "'upon both houses of Parliament. "'From the houses of Parliament, then, we have no hope. "'The strong hand of the people must do it. "'You might as well ask the lords to abolish hereditary aristocracy, "'or the king to dethrone himself, "'as expect the houses of Parliament to sweep away the chancery court.' "'What could we do without it?' inquired an attentive listener. "'Do without it!' exclaimed Proud indignantly, almost contemptuously at the nature of the question. "'Certainly we can. France does without it, Holland does without it, Prussia does without it, Switzerland does without it, and the United States do without it, and where is the law of property better administered than in those countries?' There the transfer of land or the bequeathing of other property is as simple as that of merchandise or stock. But here, here, in England, which vaunts its freedom and its civilization, the process is encumbered with forms and deeds which leave the whole arrangement liable to flaws, difficulties, and endless embarrassments. Talk of equity, indeed! Tis the most shameless mockery of justice ever known even amongst barbarians. But let me tell you an anecdote. In 1763 a suit was commenced in Chancery relative to some lawful property, on which there was a windmill. The cause was not referred to the master till 1796, thirty-three years having elapsed, and the lawyers who had grown old during the proceedings, and not having been idle. In the master's office did the case remain till 1815, though the new lawyers who had succeeded the old batch that had died off in the meantime, were as active as the matter would allow them to be. Well, in 1815 the master began to look into the business, but behold, the windmill had disappeared. It had tumbled down. It had wasted away into dust. Not a trace of it remained. Actually shrieked out the old man in the excitement of his story. Footnote. The anecdote is a positive fact. End footnote. Thus the affair was fifty-two years in chancery, and was knocked on the head after all, observed one of the company present. While law slept, time was awake and busy, you see, said Prout, with a bitter irony which actually chilled the hearts of his auditors. But I can give you plenty of examples of the infernal, heart-breaking delays of chancery, and my own amongst the rest presently, he continued. There is the case of Butte v. Stewart. It began in 1793 and in 1813 a step was made in the cause. Footnote. It is not terminated yet. In footnote. Then again you have the case of the Attorney General versus Trevelyan. It commenced in 1685 and is an affair involving an endowment for a grammar school at Morpeth. This cause will never be finished. Footnote. Mr. Prout's prophecy seems likely to be fulfilled for the cause pens yet having now lasted one hundred and sixty-two years. In 1710 Lord Chancellor Harcourt made a decree commanding the boundaries of the litigated land to be ascertained, and the commissioner appointed to carry this decree into effect reported that no boundaries could be traced. In 
proceedings continued and on the 25th of January 1846 the case was re-argued before Vice-Chancellor Shadwell, eight counsel being engaged for relator, lessee, trustees, corporation, and the various other parties interested. The Vice-Chancellor of England referred the matter to the Master's Office, where it is not likely to be disinterred for the next half-century. Really, we English are a highly civilized people. A lawsuit may be perpetuated through a dozen generations without any delay or fault on the side of the parties interested, the whole and sole blame resting upon the Chancery Court. In footnote. But how much property do you suppose there is locked up in Chancery, eh? And now I am going to tell you something astounding indeed, and yet as true as the gospel. Thirty-eight million sterlings are locked up in that dreadful tribunal. A tribunal? No, it is a sepulchre, a tomb, a grave in which all justice and all hopes are interred. But you will say that this enormous fund is only as it were in temporary trust to be in due time portioned out to its rightful owners. Pshaw! Nonsense! More than one-third concerns persons who are dead and have left no heirs, or else whose representatives are ignorant of their rights. The suitor's fund is a bank of plunder, of shameful diabolical plunder effected under the forms of the law. But what about your own case, old fellow? inquired the Honourable Mr. Pettifer. I'll tell you in a moment, gentlemen, said Prout, rejoiced to observe the interest created by his strictures on the most hellish tribunal that ever disgraced a civilized country. Twenty-five years ago, he said, I was a prosperous man, having a good business in the city, and I had managed to save four thousand pounds by dint of strict economy and the closest attention to my affairs. A lawyer, a friend of mine, told me of a favorable opportunity to place the sum out at good interest, and on the best possible security. A gentleman, in fact, wanted to borrow just that amount on mortgage, he having a capital estate. The matter was fully investigated, and the security was considered unexceptional. So I lent the money and for three years the interest was regularly paid, and all went on well. The gentleman suddenly died, and his nephew, who inherited the estate, hunted out an old entail, effected a hundred and fifty years previously, and of the existence of such an entail no mention had been made in subsequent deeds. So the nephew would not acknowledge the validity of the mortgage, and refused to pay me a fraction of my four thousand pounds. He would not even settle the interest. I was therefore forced into chancery, and seven years afterwards I got a decree in my favour. But I was sent into the master's office on account of certain details which I will not stop to explain to you. This was fifteen years ago, and I am still in chancery. I have spent three thousand pounds in costs, and am totally ruined. The excitement and worry of law made me neglect my business, my affairs fell into confusion, my creditors took all my stock in trade and here have I been eleven years for the balance of my liabilities. Twenty-two years have I been engaged in law, and have not yet got justice. And yet I am told that I live in a civilized country where the laws are based on consummate wisdom, and where the meanest as well as the highest individual is sure to obtain justice. Justice indeed! Such justice as one finds in the Chancery Court. My original claim was for four thousand pounds, and I have spent three thousand in cost and owe my lawyers five hundred pounds more. But what do you think of this? Eight years ago a written question was put by the master to the respondent in the suit, and it is still a matter of dispute whether he is to answer it or not. Here's law for you. Here's justice. Why, it is enough to make a man curse himself for belonging to a country in which such things take place. It is enough to make me ashamed of being an Englishman. Suppose a savage from the South Sea Islands came to England, beheld all the glitter and glory of our outward appearance of civilization, studied our language, and was then told of cases such as these. What would he think? He would say, After all, you are in reality a very barbarous people, and I shall be glad when I get back to my own far-off island. Footnote. Mr. Commissioner Fane of the London Bankruptcy Court was brought up as a chancery lawyer, and in a recent letter to Lord Cottenham he thus explains the causes of that shameful dilatoriness which characterizes chancery proceedings. In chancery the suitor applies first to the judge. Everything is done in writing. 
The judge, after great expense has been incurred and after a long delay, makes a decree. That decree tells the master in endless detail what he is to do, just as if he required to be taught the simplest matters. The decree is drawn up not by the judge, who might be thought wiser than the master, but by the registrar, who in teaching the master frequently omits some material direction. The parties then adjourn to the master's office. There the matter lingers, month after month and year after year. At last the master makes his report, tells the court what he has found, and sometimes what he would have found if the registrar had authorized him to do so. And at last the court either acts or sends the matter back to the master with new directions. Meanwhile, as Lord Bacon said about two hundred years ago, though the chancery pace be slow, the suitor's pulse beat quick. I know of nothing to which to compare this process except the game of battledore and shuttlecock in which the poor suitor plays the part of shuttlecock, and is tossed from the judge to the master, and from the master to the judge, over and over, till the scene is closed only too often by despair, insolvency, or death. In footnote. As far as all this goes, you are right enough, observed an attorney, who was one of the company present. But had you gone much farther, you would have been equally correct. You may denounce nearly all our laws and statutes to be radically bad and a disgrace to civilization. But it is useless to hope that an efficient reform will ever be effected by the Parliament, because the Parliament is loath to interfere with existing usages, and is afraid to meddle with existing rights. Nothing short of a revolution can possibly accomplish a proper change. Why, this is treason, exclaimed the Honorable Mr. Pettifer his aristocratic feelings deeply wounded by the lawyer's bold and manly declaration. "'It may be treason, but it is nevertheless the truth,' said the attorney, with the cool firmness of a man entertaining an honest conviction of the justice of his observations. "'I declare most of our laws to be a disgrace and a shame. In France all the laws are contained in one book accessible to every person. Here in this country they are totally inaccessible to the community in general.' Do you think France would ever have had her code without a revolution? Footnote. The code Napoleon is sometimes declared to be a failure, but it has been no failure. In place of the previously differing laws of the provinces of the ancient kingdom, it has substituted a consistent uniform code for the entire of France. But it is urged that it has been buried under a load of commentaries. Of course there has arisen a pile of judicial constructions, as must be the case with the text of every code. But these constructions have a platform to rest upon, framed in the light of modern science. Ours are wholly different. They have no such foundation to settle upon. They rest upon a mingled heap of rubbish and masonry, of obsolete laws and laws in force. Even the basement story has not been firmly laid as in France. This, however, it is that the nation requires to have done. It requires an entirely new legal edifice to be erected. All that is good in the past it would have preserved under a new and better arrangement, and then the mass of statutes, reports, and textbooks from which the analysis had been made, and which had long embarrassed both the learned and unlearned, declared by parliamentary authority to be no better than waste paper, null and void, and no more citable for any purpose of legal argument, illustration, or decision. Black Book of England. In footnote. Do you know how silly, absurd, and contradictory are some of our statutes? Those statutes which are approved of by the law officers of the Crown and enacted by wise senators. There is a statute, for example's sake, footnote, 53rd, George the Third. end footnote, which decrees that one half of the penalty inflicted in a particular case is to go to the informer and the other half to the king. And yet under this statute judges sentence men to transportation, say fourteen years' transportation to be halved by the informer and the king. And then there are statutes still upon the book, and which, though unrepealed, could scarcely be put into execution without inflicting an odious tyranny. A statute of Edward the Sixth forbids agricultural laborers to hire themselves out or to be hired by the day, and not for less than a year. By a statute of William and Mary, no peasant may sell goods in a town except at a fair, and a statute of Henry the Seventh decrees under severe penalties that no cattle shall be killed in a walled town nor in Cambridge. 
There is also a statute, I forget of which reign, enacting that no shoemaker may be a tanner, nor a tanner a shoemaker. The laws relating to marriage are in many respects absurd and in others obscure. A marriage contracted by persons under age by means of license without the consent of their parents is unlawful, but such persons may contract a lawful marriage by bans, although without the consent of their parents. Thousands and thousands of persons have been led to believe that it is lawful for a man to marry his deceased wife's sister, whereas it is not lawful, and the issue of such a marriage is illegitimate. At this moment the learned gentleman was interrupted by the clanging of a loud bell carried by a person who was proceeding round the main building of the prison, and who every now and then stopped ringing for the purpose of vociferating as loud as he could, "'Strangers, women and children, all out!' "'Shall you have to leave?' demanded Frank Curtis in a whisper to his friend the captain. "'Divil a hapworth of it, me boy!' exclaimed O'Blunderbuss. "'The person who keeps the coffee-house will be glad to give me a bed as well as yourself. "'For money, friend Curtis, procures everything in this blessed Spike Island.' Another half-hour was passed in discourse on various topics, the inmates of the coffee-house parlour having become wearied of commenting upon the laws of their country, and at the expiration of that interval renewed shouts now emanating from the immediate vicinity of the lower tower warned all strangers to quit the prison. At the same time the parlour was rapidly cleared. O'Blunderbuss and Frank Curtis alone remained there, for it seemed to be a rule on the part of the prisoners to rush to the gate for the purpose of seeing the strangers take their departure. The captain now gave a furious pull at the bell and when the slipshod waiter appeared he demanded a conference with the keeper of the coffee-house. The request was speedily complied with, and satisfactory arrangements were entered into for beds. Another bottle of wine was ordered, the captain persuading Curtis that it would be better for him to take his first survey of all the grand features of the bench in the morning, and to pass the evening in conviviality. This they accordingly did until eleven o'clock, when the lights in the parlour were put out and the two gentlemen were shown to their respective bedchambers, the said chambers being about twice as big as a coffin, and quite as inconveniently angular. End of section 111 Recording by Philip Gould